It's been a while since I've been on a low-budget binge. The holidays have wreaked havoc on my reviewing schedule, but I still managed to wrangle up another flock of indie delights for you lo-fi horror fans. Let's start binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below, share this video with all of your social media addicted pals, click subscribe to this channel, and ring that bell for notifications. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. Those Who Call is new on-demand and digital download from Uncorked Entertainment. It's directed and written by Anubis Lopez. Two sisters on their way to a hiking trip break down in the middle of nowhere and end up running for their lives from some kind of cult in the woods. I'm not going to mince words. Those Who Call is a complete waste of time. While it delivers a death in the first few minutes in the opener, the rest of the film is basically the two leads walking through the woods, running through the woods, and arguing with one another while walking and running. Nothing happens in this film. It's all lead up to a big revelation at the end, and then the credits roll. I don't know how I did it, but I endured this one and finished it, but I won't encourage others to do so. If it were a pair of great actors doing all of this walking and talking, or even a decent point to the amount of time dedicated to the circular conversations the two of them have, this film might have redeemed itself. But neither are the case. Yet Lanizi Rodriguez and Angie Sandoval are just okay in the leads as the sisters. But since this film relies on the two of them talking back and forth ad nauseum, it highlights the actress's inexperience and weaknesses in line delivery and emotional communication. On top of that, they don't encounter anything on their path other than some craft fair pumpkin heads hanging on sticks. Instead, oddly transitioned flashbacks are peppered throughout that I guess was meant to give the arguments between the two sisters time to grow. But there really is no depth to these arguments. One sister wants to keep the house, the other doesn't. One sister wants to bury her dad, the other wants to cremate him. There's no pep or real need for any of these moments to be shown other than to pad this film, and that's about it. I really am a supporter of indie films, but I hate having my time wasted. Those who call might have had some passion in it, but it isn't conveyed on the screen by the actors or the filmmakers. It's just running and arguing for about an hour and 15 minutes, and there are scores of other movies that give you much more than that in less time. Not a recommend. The Death of April is new on-demand and digital download. It's directed and written by Ruben Rodriguez. The Death of April is more reminiscent of the excellent mockumentary Lake Mungo, though aspects of this film do feel like found footage, and the film itself is made up of footage of a video diary found by police on a laptop. Still, there are those who will write this one off simply because it's filmed in a more handheld first-person POV talking to the camera style, which many find immediately off-putting. But doing so would definitely be a mistake, as The Death of April feels much more like a Dateline NBC episode, crafted to build interest and tension more than anything else. The film is interspersed with interviews with the family of Megan Mullen, a young bright-eyed teen who moves from her house on the West Coast to New Jersey for a change and to follow her dreams. But right off the bat, as Megan begins filming an online journal reporting her adjustments to her new apartment and life, things seem to be slightly off. Though there is the occasional blip in the video or weird shadowy movement in the corner, for the most part of the first 40 minutes, it's all build up with the family talking in foreboding tones about Megan in the past tense, suggesting that their relationship with her is gone. Whether that means Megan is dead or what is unclear and remains a mystery throughout the entire movie, as the audience is made privy to her journal entries one at a time. A sparkly-eyed twenty-something with the whole world ahead of her disintegrates into a paranoid soul obsessed with the story of the apartment's past resident named April, who was killed in the apartment mysteriously. As the strange happenings intensify and the family's stories get more emotional and remorseful, it's evident something dire is going to happen. 
What works in The Death of April is the ever-growing sense of dread and horror that begins slowly but enlarges into an immense weight by the end of the film. The film will definitely keep you guessing, hoping for the best for this likable girl, but fearing that all signs point to things getting horribly worse. The problem is that because of the build-up, the final scenes lack the heft I was expecting. And while there are some amazingly tense and frightening scenes speckled throughout the film, the end feels a bit lackluster in comparison. I don't know what I was expecting, but the simplistic way things ended up left me wanting. That said, both Katerina Hughes, who plays Megan, and Adam Lauder, who plays her brother, Stephen, and who looks a lot like a young Christopher Reeve, do phenomenal jobs in the film. Hughes makes you like her immediately as she appears in front of the screen as Megan, and the concern she causes her brother is resonant through the eyes of Louder. The rest of the cast is pretty good as well, and because of the performances, the film is all the more naturalistic and convincing. Though the ending didn't blow me away, I have to give it up for The Death of April. The overall sense of horror that begins small and grows to massive proportions is doled out in a conservative yet ever-increasing manner. Writer-director Ruben Rodriguez proves he's a patient director who painstakingly holds back on the punch, yet hints that the blow could come at almost any time from anywhere. Because this indistinguishable sense of danger looming in the dark corners of Megan's apartment is so well realized, it makes up for the letdown of the end. If you're looking for a movie that will creep up on you and stick with you, The Death of April is it. Ah, what the hell, let's do one last Christmas horror movie. Why not? Oh my God, Christmas time again. Christmas Cruelty, a.k.a. O Helge Jewel, is new on Blu-ray and DVD from Unearthed Films. It's directed by Per Ingvar Tomren and Magni Steinsvoll. Steinsvoll. It's written by Alni Aishem and John Aaron Hostler, Holstetter, and Anita Nyhagen. I found one last Christmas horror film to share this year, and Christmas Cruelty is a doozy. While three slackers drink, gab, and party their way through their holiday vacation, a serial killer Santa Claus, played by Tormod Lean, invades houses, binds the people inside, beats them, rapes them, and kills whoever he pleases. These parties are bound to meet up, and it's going to be a cruel Christmas for everyone involved. There's not much by way of story in Christmas Cruelty. It's more of a schlocky gore-fest style film meant to disgust, nauseate, and offend just about everyone watching. It seems like it really wants to be a Tarantino-esque kind of film, but it ends up being way too focused on the gore and violence than anything else. The film begins with our sadistic Santa Claus raping a woman in front of her tied-up family. He then sings to himself and makes his merry way over to a set of tools, grabs a motorized saw, then unleashes its whirling blades on an infant in a crib. Say what you will about how gross the opener is, but Christmas cruelty wastes no time letting you know just what kind of horror movie it is. The gore in this movie is unmatched, and if you were titillated and entertained by the over-the-top grew and gop from the Terrifier series, Christmas Cruelty feels like it's a long-lost cousin from the icy lands of Norway. But there's little else by way of horror going on with Christmas Cruelty. The story meanders around with a trio of goofballs who chat and argue and pontificate while getting drunk and high. I'm all for a little getting to know you time with our stars before they face off with the monster in the movie, but time felt like it was crawling while these three occupied the screen. The arguments are ugly, chauvinistic, and most of the time just plain stupid, and so are the times when they are trying to say something poignant. The only thing that kept me invested was that I knew the Santa was on his way and I was looking forward to these guys getting theirs. I will say that the Norwegian metal music that was peppered throughout Christmas Cruelty was a lot of fun. It's a cool look at sounds from another country, and the music is often ironically used as it plays against these scenes of depravity. Still, the horrifying acts that this Santa inflicts upon his victims goes beyond the realm of simple gore. Much screen time follows the monster's every despicable move from one victim to the next. Tormod Lean's disregard for humanity is unparalleled. Though he is despicable, the actor is all in for this disturbingly graphic role. He even takes the time to put on a condom before raping his chosen victims. 
but at least he's being safe. The casual way this Santa moves through the house and takes out the occupants is pretty impressive in some well-choreographed scenes of violence. The gore, of course, is as realistic as it comes. If you didn't know any better, these were real people being dissected ruthlessly. And Santa's mask is utterly chilling with its eye holes blacked out completely. This kind of tasteless violence is the staple of unearthed films, a company dedicated to the over-the-top and gratuitous gore and sex in its films, Christmas Gruelty is not for mainstream horror fans, it's for the gorehounds. And if that's your bag, this Santa has a whole hell of a lot of monstrous blood and guts to share for those who have been naughty this year. Night of the Bastard, aka Marlin, is new on demand and digital download from Dark Sky Films. It's directed by Eric Boccio and written by Eric Boccio, Christian Ackerman, and Chuck Foster. Reed is the bastard, played by London May, a hermit living with his turtle in a mobile home in the middle of the desert. It seems Reed once lived as a part of the world, but he no longer does, and he likes it that way. When an out-of-breath and wounded woman named Kiera, played by Maya Hudson, bangs on his door, he's pulled into a conflict with a cult pursuing her. Led by sultry priestess Claire, played by Hannah Pierce, the group lays siege to Reed's trailer in order to retrieve Kira for their own reasons, leaving Kira, Reed, and Marlin to fight Tooth, Turtle Shell, and Nail against the evil cultists. I get what the filmmakers behind Night of the Bastard are going for. There's a gritty and grimy feel to not only the film, but the characters in the film and the actors playing them. The first time we see the bastard, he wakes up passed out on the ground in the middle of the desert from a drunken stupor. He's pissed himself and is severely hung over. So he hangs up his pants to dry and walks buck naked around and then finally into his mobile home. It's a hell of an intro and one I could have seen someone like Steve McQueen or Warren Oates pull off. He's a dusty, grindhousey, down to earth and flawed kind of hero you'd see in a typical 70s schlocker. Night of the Bastard is made for cheap, but done so with a deep appreciation for those 70s drive-in flicks that were not out to change the world, but just give you a rollicking good time for a little while before you started making out with your date. For the most part, Night of the Bastard succeeds in giving a violent and bloody story as the cult goes against the bastard and the gal under his watch. The bad guys are indeed bad, and realized comically differing from one another. There's a punk rocker, a hippie, a bodybuilder, an old witch, and a witchy cult leader. It's one of those mishmash groups that would never really hang out together, but it makes each baddie look distinct and provide a unique challenge for our bastard hero. The action is brutal and extremely violent. It's evident the people behind this film took glee in making each kill different and bloody. Unfortunately, London May isn't the best of actors, and while he physically pulls off the gnarly action and looks the part of the grizzled leading man, his line delivery just really isn't that great. A lot of the others in this film aren't the best either in the acting department. This makes the downtime when the drama is supposed to be communicated a bit of a drudge. The pace is a bit wonky, as is the timeline, but these types of issues plague all grindhousey films, which are much more focused on boobs, blood, and body parts. It's got a turtle, which I found myself strangely endeared to, and of course it's got boobs, guns, explosions, blood, and all types of fun action sequences. Night of the Bastard is lo-fi schlock and proud of it. There's an audience for that. It's not up to tier with such modern grindhouse greats as Hobo with a Shotgun, The Editor, She Kills, and Dear God No, which deliver an inspired amount of over-the-top action, raunchy humor, in-your-face irony, gut-churning gore, and just plain goddamn wrongness. But Night of the Bastard definitely fits into the same category with these grindhouse standouts. So at least you know what you're in for for this one. History of the Occult, a.k.a. Historia de lo Oculto, is new streaming on Screenbox. It's directed and written by Kristen Ponce. A group of producers attempt to uncover a conspiracy leading all the way up to the Argentinian presidency that leads back to a coven of witches and warlocks. They try to expose the truth on live television on a show called 60 Minutes to Midnight. But many forces, human and otherwise, are working hard to keep the truth unknown by the masses. History of the Occult is supposed to be one of the most successful Latin horrors of all time, ranking as the highest rated horror movie of 2021 on Letterboxd Year in Review Roundup as rated by Letterboxd users. All of that is fine and dandy, but how is the film? Well, it's interesting. I'll give you that. 
One of the things that I think is a huge detriment to history of the occult is that it requires its viewer to understand the politics and policies of Argentina, specifically what they were like in the 1980s when this film was set. That's a pretty specific requirement that a lot of U.S. viewers are not going to know, so a lot of the details involving specific points in Argentinian history are going to fall on deaf ears if you aren't from that country. Now, I do understand conspiracy and distrust in the government. It's pretty much a universal notion. So though I wasn't up to date with the state of the Argentinian Union in 1985, I still got the gist of what was going on. So my recommendation is not to get caught up in the details laid out of History of the Occult and simply follow the human emotion and feelings presented along the way, and you might have an okay time with this film. That said, History of the Occult does a really good job bringing a talk show in the 80s to life with natural acting from the host as well as the guests on the panel, and over-reliance on advertising so the show takes breaks with its very own commercials, which seem to be tied to the conspiracy as well, and a tendency to go off and on the air, seemingly edited by the government or other dimensional forces, or maybe both. In making this show believable, it makes for a compelling 60-minute style roundtable discussion about conspiracy, the occult, and other issues involving the two. During the commercial breaks, the story cuts to a group of the show's producers hoping to lead a rebellion against the occult-backed government movement. This is where most of the emotional beats come from, and it's going to convey how important this show is to the common man watching. There are also snippets outside of the watching room, where the information proving the occult government connection has been attained. The whole thing is crisply edited, flipping through flashbacks, info gathering, and people's reactions at a rapid-fire clip that made Oliver Stone's conspiracy films like JFK so effective. The sense of urgency and stress communicated in History of the Occult works very well. That said, History of the Occult is for the patient and those who appreciate this slow burn. There are some very subtle yet terrifying scenes of strange happenings, but for the most part, the bulk of the film is a group staring at a television screen and a McLaughlin Report style roundtable show. While there is a persistent sense of dread and doom floating in the air around this story, I wouldn't call History of the Occult a thrill a minute. I found it somewhat dry in delivery, yet was compelled by the conspiracy angle and the use of the 60 minutes style format. But don't go looking for a slam bang horror movie here. It's more of the horror that creeps up on you from the periphery, which to some will be just the kind of sneaky horror they're looking for. Your enjoyment will vary, but I will recommend History of the Occult for those who like their terrors in slow, sneaky doses. Stuck inside your 